Book 2, Chapter 1 While my brother was escaping from London, the curate and I were in the empty house at Halliford, where we fled to escape the black smoke. We stopped there all Sunday night, and all the next day, the day of the panic. It was a little island of daylight, cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. We could do nothing but wait during those two weary days. My mind was occupied by anxiety for my wife. I imagined her at Leatherhead, terrified, in danger, mourning me already as a dead man. I grew very weary and irritable with the sight of the curate's selfish despair. I kept away from him. I went to a box room at the top of the house and locked myself in. I wanted to be alone with my aching miseries. We were hopelessly hemmed in by the black smoke all that day and the morning of the next. The black smoke drifted slowly down the river throughout Monday morning. It was creeping nearer and nearer to us. A Martian came across the fields about midday. He fired a jet of superheated steam that hissed against the walls. It smashed all the windows it touched and scalded the curate's hand as he fled out of the front room. Later, we saw that the country to the north was as though a black snowstorm had passed over it. Looking towards the river, we were astonished to see redness mingling with the black of the scorched meadows. I began to realise that we were no longer hemmed in by the black smoke. The way of escape was open and my dream of action returned. But the curate was lethargic, unreasonable. We are safe here, he repeated. Safe here. I resolved to leave him. Would that I had. When it was clear to the curate that I meant to go alone, he suddenly roused himself to come. We started off about five o'clock along the blackened road to Sunbury. In Sunbury, and at intervals along the road, were dead bodies, horses as well as men, overturned carts and luggage, all covered thickly with black dust. There were more people about in Twickenham than none could give us news. Many of the houses here were still occupied by scared inhabitants, too frightened even for flight. We crossed Richmond Bridge about half past eight. Here again on the Surrey side, were dead bodies, a heap near the approach to the station. Then, suddenly, as we approached Kew, came a number of people running. The upper works of a Martian fighting machine loomed in sight over the housetops. We were so terrified that we dared not go on, but turned aside and hid in a shed in a garden. There the curate crouched, weeping silently and refusing to stir again. But my fixed idea of reaching Leatherhead would not let me rest. In the twilight, I ventured out again. The curate I left in the shed, but he came hurrying after me. No sooner had the curate overtaken me than we saw a fighting machine far away across the meadows. Four or five little black figures hurried before the Martian, across a field. In three strides he was among them, and they ran, radiating from his feet in all directions. He used no heat ray to destroy them, but picked them up one by one. We stood for a moment, petrified, then turned and fled through a gate behind us and into a walled garden. Falling into a fortunate ditch, we lay there, scarce daring to whisper to each other until the stars were out. I suppose it was nearly eleven o'clock before we gathered courage to start again. We no longer ventured into the road, but sneaked along hedgerows and through fields. All the while, we were watching keenly through the darkness, he on the right and I on the left, for the Martians who seemed to be all about us. 
Sheen was silent and deserted. Here, my companion suddenly complained of faintness and thirst, and we decided to try one of the houses. The first house we entered, after a little difficulty with the window, was a small, semi-detached villa. We found a store of food, two loaves of bread and a half of ham, and some bottled beer. We sat in the kitchen in the dark, for we dared not strike a light, and ate bread and ham, and drank beer out of the same bottle. The curate, who was still nervous, was now, oddly enough, for pushing on. It can't be midnight yet, I said. At that moment came a blinding glare of vivid green light, and then followed such an explosion as I have never heard before or since. The plaster of the ceiling came down upon us, smashing into a multitude of fragments upon our heads. I was knocked headlong across the floor and was unconscious for a long time. When I came to, we were in darkness again. The curate, with a face wet with blood from a cut forehead, was dabbing water over me. For some time, I could not re recollect what had happened. Then things came to me slowly. Are you better? asked the curate in a whisper. I sat up. Don't move, he said. I think they are outside. We both sat quite silent, so that we could scarcely hear each other breathing. Everything seemed deadly still. Outside and very near was an intermittent metallic rattle. Do you hear? said the curate. And presently it happened again. Yes, I said, but what is it? A Martian! For three or four hours, until the dawn came, we scarcely moved, and then the light filtered in. Outside, the soil was banked high against the house. At the top of the window frame, we could see an uprooted drain pipe. It was evident that the greater part of the house had collapsed. As the dawn grew clearer, we saw through the gap in the wall the body of a Martian. He was standing sentinel, I suppose, over a still glowing cylinder. The fifth cylinder, I whispered. The fifth shot from Mars has struck this house and buried us under the ruins. For a time, the curate was silent, and then he whispered, God have mercy upon us. I sat with my eyes fixed on the faint light of the kitchen door. I could just see the curate's face, a dim oval shape, and his collar and cuffs. Outside there began a metallic hammering, then a violent hooting, and then again, after a quiet interval, a hissing, like the hissing of an engine. These noises continued intermittently and seemed to increase in number as time went on. At nightfall, the ghostly kitchen doorway became absolutely dark. For many hours, we must have crouched there, silent and shivering. Eventually, hunger moved me into action. I told the curate I was going to seek food and felt my way towards the pantry. I heard him crawling after me. Chapter 2 After eating, we crept back to the scullery, where I must have dozed again. When I looked round, I was alone. The thudding vibration continued. I whispered for the curate several times, and then felt my way to the door of the kitchen. It was still daylight, and I perceived him across the room. He was lying against a triangular hole that looked out upon the Martians. I could see the top of a tree touched with gold and the warm blue of a tranquil evening sky. For a minute or so, I remained watching the curate. Then I advanced, crouching and stepping with extreme care amid the broken crockery that littered the floor. I touched the curate's leg. He started so violently that a mass of plaster 
went sliding down the outside and fell with a loud impact. I gripped his arm, fearing he might cry out, and for a long time we crouched, motionless. Then I turned to see how much of our rampart remained. The detachment of the plaster had left a vertical slit open in the debris. I was able to see out of this gap into what had been overnight a quiet suburban roadway. The fifth cylinder must have fallen directly on the house next door. The building had vanished, completely smashed, pulverised and dispersed by the blow. The cylinder lay now far beneath the original foundations. Our house had collapsed backwards. The front portion had been destroyed completely. By chance, the kitchen and scullery had escaped. We were on the very edge of the great circular pit the Martians were making. The cylinder was already opened in the centre of the pit. On the farther edge of the pit, amid the smashed and gravel-heaped shrubbery, was one of the great fighting machines and stood stiff and tall against the evening sky. Strange creatures were crawling slowly and painfully across the heaped mould near it. The mechanism was one of what have since been called handling machines. My first impression of it was of a sort of metallic spider. Its motion was so swift, complex and perfect that at first I did not see it as a machine, but as an unearthly, crab-like creature. The Martians had huge round bodies, or rather heads, about four feet in diameter. Each body had in front of it a face. This face had no nostrils. Indeed, the Martians do not seem to have had any sense of smell. But it had a pair of very dark-coloured eyes, just beneath a kind of fleshy beak. Strange as it may seem to a human being, the Martians did not eat, much less digest. Instead, they took the fresh, living blood of other creatures and injected it into their own veins. A vivid blood-red weed spread up the sides of the pit by the third or fourth day of our imprisonment. Its cactus-like branches came to the edges of our triangular window. I am convinced that the Martians interchanged thoughts telepathically. While I was still watching their sluggish motions in the sunlight and noting each strange detail of their form, the curate reminded me of his presence by pulling violently at my arm. I turned to a scowling face. He wanted the slit, which permitted only one of us to peep through. The busy handling machine piped and whistled as it worked. So far as I could see, the thing was without a directing Martian at all. 